stories have two great truths. First, begin in many ways that are all more or less the same. Second, they all have an end. Fortunately, all great truths are lies. So there's the stuff that happens in between. But all stories must have a beginning. This story begins with me napping awake to the rhythmic clickety clack of the trolley. I felt like I've been asleep for a long time. My mind swirled with the same veil of fog that my eyes were trying in vain to blink away. So I shrugged and looked out the window. I saw streets and storefronts and tore blankets of snow draping chimney tops. The sights and sounds of the town I called home, flooding by like the scattered fragments of a dream. No, scattered toys cast aside by some less than charitable hand. That was more like it. And who have wondered idly, was stooped to pick them up and put them back in their places. A fitting reverie for a town so small and so white and crusted that it might as well have been a movie set. There was a church on 5th Street, at the very center of town. The steeple jutted high up, towards low and heavy clouds laden with snow. On that steeple was a clock whose hand were stop at 3 o'clock, stuck in frozen time. That was the air this town gave off, framed by the stilled hands of the only prominent clock within city limits. It seemed to me that, actually, it was not a clock but the town itself that was out of order. It made things a lot easier to accept if you thought about them that way. Yeah, nothing strange about that at all. The trolley gl glided to a gentle halt, the bricks shuddering like the mincing footfalls of a woman with something infinitely fragile and precious in her arms. The doors floated open, the cabin inhaled, the winds skirled at my feet. I shivered at the cold and stood up. A gray coat was draped on the seat next to me. I reached for it and put it on in one smooth motion. The station was just about abandoned when I stepped off. I strode slowly through familiar streets. Here and there I saw storefronts, closed packed houses, flowers blooming in frozen gardens, blissful of ignorance. Nine short blocks from the station. I turned right at the intersection. The road turned upward in my feet as if in response. From the top of the hill, a careworn edifice of wind blasted stone and poked mortuary glared down at me. So that was where I was headed, probably. In my every step, the buildings grew sparser and sparser as if they were afraid of my destination's long shadow. Soon enough, Ina Cobblestones had lost their courage and fled leaving me to face a grove of trees by myself. No more paved roads from this point on, then. I could feel the soft loam clinging to my shoes with every footfall. I stopped at a stone wall with an iron gate. Both it and the building had seen better days. And when the freezing winds whipped through fallen brick and rusted metal, the entire place could be heard to scream. The gate shuddered when the air tore at its broken hinges. Soon, it would fall onto earth and dreamless slumber. When, not if, just a matter of time. I just pushed my way past that complaining scrap of iron when snow started whispering from the ashen sky. There was someone standing at the doorway. A young girl, my eyes did not deceive me. She was silent and prim, her straight back dusted by the wavering snow. She turned to face me as I drew near, but I heard my approach. I got my first good glimpse of her waned face past a gauzy white veil of cold that fell from the sky. I sighed inwardly and fished my hands out of my pockets. Hello there. The girl just blinked slowly in surprise. You are welcome here. No one will hurt you. So come, dry your tears. But she did no such thing. She just kept staring up at me tear after tear, carving harsh paths down her soft, pale face. My name is Black Iris. I'll make sure you get settled in, so be at ease. If you wish to call me by some other name, go right ahead and do so. I won't mind. So, my army guest, may I ask, 
What's your name? This is all strictly by the book. Well, it was until I asked her her name. She shut, shut her eyes tight, began to wipe her face clean. Motions were clumsy and halting. Her brave gesture, though it did not at all stop the flow of tears from her eyes. Lenny. La. Huh? My name, La. The voice was high and warm. It must have quavered and cold in shock. I see. Very well. La? Right this way, please. It's too cold to be standing around outside after all. Okay. She nodded and she did the most astonishing thing. She came close, stood on tiptoe with such small, small hands, began brushing the snow off my shoulders. Such a good girl. She left me with no choice but to do well for her sake. We walked into the old building side by side. And that is how our story really begins. The world shall groan with tears unfold. Tomorrow's wings shall never unfold. You know how to say that the songs of an age supposedly embody the spirit of its inhabitants? Well, such were the songs of our age. And for good reason. We see no end to earthly tragedy. In people in the prime of the youth are offering themselves in despair. Suicide had become by far the leading cause of all ages mortality worldwide. As the phenomenon swept the globe, people began to call it by a name. The medical community, the skull at first, hemmed and hawed, complained about clinical depression and diagnosis criteria, as something useless called DSMV, and it finally gave in. That was years ago. By the present day, the term the dolor was firmly established in the medical lexicon, as the term the plague had been ages past. Our government, of course, mobilized every resource it could in order to study and hopefully counteract the dolor. They established this town, for instance. Because they established this town, I was able to make a living here, serving as a guide of sorts for newcomers. Specifically, I make sure they got settled in. And so I did, so I helped them forget, one by one, the horrors their eyes had seen. Yes, the town's my only duty. 
to sever the ties of heartbreak and isolation that bound our guests, saying their souls filled them with dolor. This was, after all, the so-called city where memories come to die. And I was, after all, a so-called monomicide. Monomicide. The word bears little explaining. As millions perished in the throes of the dolor, the medical community took a sweet time to pronounce a consensus that even a five-year-old would have found obvious, namely that the etiology of the dolor was this crushing feeling of sadness and hope helplessness that left people with no other, other option but self-slaughter. A special conference of the top psychiatrists in the world was convened, and the days of deliberation decided to make up some fancy names that meant nothing. The reason that the dollar ate away the afflicted mind the way that rust ate away that metal. Psych corrosion, they called it. Talk about fiddling way while Rome burn, burns. Oh, there's one problem with that analogy. See, Nero didn't fiddle at all. He opened his palaces to this place, where far stricter fire codes post haste. Whereas these psychiatrists, that's all they ever did, fiddle away while we all died. Anyway, patients who had failed all other methods of therapy were assigned to what was known as the Monomicide Protocol. They were brought to this town. It was here that we, Monomicides, cut away the tie bindings or guests in the memories that had so corroded their psyches. The thing was, not just anyone could become a Monomicide. One had to have certain qualities that inborn talents before one could even embark on the path. To this day, I would never know whether I was blessed or cursed when it came, turned out that I had just those qualities, just those talents. People often pulled us aside, told us how sweet and seemingly it was for us to do our duty for our country, how much they envy us, idiotic patriotic drivel like that. None of it particularly impressed me. How do you explain? How can you explain to someone who would never understand that you're Every working day is a long fall into rapture and damnation. My new guest was off in the corner, standing away with eyes downcast at empty space as if there was some way to trace in the intricate patterns of her bewilderment in the air between us. This wasn't surprising at all. Every guest I ever met had reacted this way upon arrival in town. They all acclimated in the short order, of course. Rather, they were made to, in one way or another. But La here? Was still crying. This was bad. Really bad. I'd never seen a guest in such pitiful shape before. Slowly, as my gaze were a burden too heavy for her sight shoulders to bear, she lifted her head and locked eyes with me. Then she murmured, Don't mind me. I'll be fine. True enough. There's still f tears flowing from her eyes, but her facial expression was otherwise totally neutral. Not sad, but definitely not happy either. I guess say that to me before. Usually, it's because they have a sour so deep that they themselves are numb to the fact. Oh, really? Perhaps. But I agree with you. You'll be fine. Relax, you're my guest. Now you better in no time at all, I'm sure. I just quirk her lips vaguely in response. So she doubted I could do anything for her. I wondered how I could ever turn her cynicism into faith. I kept my mouth shut. It didn't matter. Whether she believed in me or not, I had a job to do. Right? I was her guide. Now, wasn't that a hoot? The hospitality industry really didn't, didn't suit me one bit. I'd have been much happier to stay at home and do nothing all day. Alright, La, go ahead and take your luggage out to your room. I'll be down here making dinner. Need anything? I take it you would be hungry at some point. La nodded silently and walked upstairs for her bags. Get a place my standard once over. Well place, alright. Fortunately, it was far better built than I originally thought. Unfortunately, it was far more cramped than I originally thought as well. I stood in the kitchen and wondered what to make for dinner. The refrigerator was well stocked. So, to make sure of that, 
that really mattered. Supplies ran low, I could always go buy more. It's all being paid for by the higher ups anyway. So what would Long want to eat? This too happened to be part of the job, but that didn't mean that I had to like it. I mean, what a joke. Cooking was exactly my forte, and I hated picking up after someone else, when for a fact I was monomicide, but I'd never had to put up with this nonsense. Well, stew was a pretty safe choice, right? Right, nothing to it. Opened the refrigerator, plucked out some meat and vegetables, and got down to work. I just started boiling some water when I heard Law come back downstairs. Turn around and, well, you know the face a normal person makes when confronted with an awful tangle of noise and a sort of animal entrails called Christian death metal? That was the exact expression she had plastered to her face. Something to matter? No. Not at all. Great. Now she was blushing. Blushing. And what was I supposed to do? Read her mind? You know, there's something on your mind, or rather you told me. See, when you get worried, I get worried. I'm not worried about anything. I see. So much for that approach. Well, whatever. I better things to do. Like make this stew. Anything you don't like to eat? None. Don't care for some things. Um, so in other words, there are some things you don't like to eat. Great. Man, I wasn't getting anywhere today, was I? You're not very nice. Yeah, I get that a lot. So what don't you eat? Carrots. Fair to say? That's pretty cute, actually. In its own way. Half smile rose unbidden to my lips, but then La glared at me. That was that. Okay, fine. No carrots then. Anything else? No. Need anything? Thank you, but I got everything under control. Let's have a seat. Relax. Dinner ready soon. Couldn't very well help my guests cook, after all. La shot me a disappointed look, but then shrugged and walked out of the kitchen. Okay, so all I had to do now was let the stew simmer on its own for a while. So I poked my head out of the kitchen to check up on how my guest was doing. Or not. She was just sitting on the chair, so motionless that she might as well have been mistaken for a wax doll. Her hands were clasped neatly on her lap. Her eyes were sharp and focused straight ahead. Though she'd been like this the entire time. Didn't get really tiring after a while. Um, La? There's no need to be so tense. Come, loosen up. You're one of us now. Her psych erosion that disappeared, that was. Couldn't really say when that would happen, though. Could be a week from today. Could be three months from today. Or does some exceptional cases even took years? Not tense. It's just... Before she could finish her sentence, her belly made an unhappy empty sound. This explained everything. Kind of. I take it you're hungry? Well, I just blushed and glared at me. She must have seen how hard it was trying to contain myself. The thing was... No matter what my instincts told me, I couldn't just laugh. There were tears in her eyes again. Whether that was due to the dull or embarrassment or chagrin was immaterial. I was about to make a girl cry. Wait just a bit longer, okay? I had delicious stew coming right up. By that, this time, Lao was already starting, staring pointedly out the window, ignoring me. It was a simple meal. Stew, bread, salad. Well, I was just wolfing it down as if it were the most delicious meal she ever had. I did have to wonder, though. Did famous chefs get to feel this warm, fuzzy feeling deep down inside all the time? Stop eating altogether and focus on Law. It was a trick of the light, but I could have sworn that she almost looked happy. Her son seen her in that way in all the short time I'd known her. Stop staring. Hard to eat that way. Oh, uh, sorry about that. 
Am I weird? Huh? Am I weird? Why do you keep staring at me? Oh, uh, no. You're not strange. I just kind of spaced out, that's all. Uh, bad habit of mine. You certainly do eat a lot, though. Uh, that's all. Oops. Just told a girl that she, she ate a lot. I was like, gonna get out this one. Uh, nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, it makes me happy to see you eat your fill. Right. Real smooth. Well, I just nodded warmly and smiled. What a rush of relief and suspicion all at once. I spent enough of social interactions that it was, but girls were headaches of a totally different magnitude. And this one... Yeah. By the end of dinner, La just about lost her air of bewilderment, though I couldn't tell whether it was for real or just another brave front. Although it was mu in much better shape, I was pretty used to this job by now, the first couple of days with new guests, were always a delicate phase. Best to end the day early, get a good night's nice sleep, so we'd both be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed come tomorrow. Well, I'll be doing the dishes down here, so why don't you go ahead and take a shower and go to bed? There should be a bathroom at the end of the corridor. I started to stand, but La just sat there and stared at me if there was something she wanted to say but couldn't quite articulate. Oh, right. You have my word that I won't peep. So go ahead. I'm not worried about that. It's the room. The room? Only one bed. Oh. So this must have been why she was so uptight about before dinner. Totally understandable, although that didn't stop me from sighing. I mean, alright. Now what? Come to think of it, I've never been assigned a female guest before. They always make sure you get someone of the same sex, well at least up until now. What a headache. La continued to stare at me, but there was something helpless lurking in her eyes now. It'd be so hard to make that strong facade of hers crumble into dust now if I wanted to. And, uh, I kind of wanted to. No, as a joke. Or something. Shall we sleep together? She instantly flushed red as beat. Her lips flush fluttered open and shut, open and shut like those of a goldfish out of water. This continued for a while, then she finally managed to st stammer. No, 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 thanks. I'll just sleep on the floor. Great. Now she looks like she was going to cry again. Now it was a joke. There's a sofa in the living room, so I'll just sleep there. You go ahead and take the bed. After all, I was about to make her sleep on the floor. The sofa looked nice and comfy. It wasn't as if I particularly cared. I slept in far less comfortable places than that before I took in this job. You're taller than I am. You'll cramp. I'll take the sofa. Oh, great. She really was a good girl. A super stubborn one to boot. So what was I supposed to do with her? First of all, it's not bad for me. Second of all, if it were, I wouldn't care. So there's no need for you to worry about it. But... What? Are we going to sleep together after all? I have no objection if that's what you want. Uh. She flushed red as a beat again. Nothing to it. All to do was play this out. She had to yield. At least, that's what I thought. So she just sort of quietly nodded. That is. I wasn't prepared for this. Um, La? You don't just say okay to something like that. What are you going to do if I try something? And what are you going to do? Rape me? No. But that's not the point. What if someone saw us, got the wrong idea, or something? Imagine the rumors. It was sounding like some kind of pre-show man now. So, this was what I've been reduced to. Just wonderful. What the hell's wrong with me today? You won't do anything to hurt me. I trust you. She what? Anyway, look. You happen to be my guest. 
So you take the bed, and I'll take the sofa. That's the rule. As long as we're here, we can't break it. I didn't want to play this card. I was supposed to be her guide, not her overseer. I couldn't just order around like this. But in the face of such stubbornness, I didn't think I had a choice. She looked at me if she wanted to make an objection, but then she slowly nodded. She stood up without a word after all of that and began walking towards the bathroom. Oh man. Now I was all worn out. I almost finished washing the dishes when Law suddenly reappeared in the kitchen. She had apparently been there for a while, watching me quietly. But it wasn't until I caught the faint and intoxicated smell of floral shampoo wafting from her just washed hair. From just her just washed hair that I became aware of her presence. Yes? No, it's nothing. Good night. Black iron. There was just the gentlest hint of a smile on her face as she turned heel and walked out of the kitchen. So still and listened for a long time after that. I was sure that she tucked herself in and gone to sleep. What a strange girl. Strange, but not bad at all. Every time I thought about a pain tomorrow was going to be, that bashful good night kept popping to my head. In the end, I couldn't help but smile. So she left me with no choice but to do well for her sake. Again. <laughs> Next morning, I started awake by an awful crashing sound. Interesting. I have been woken up this way before. I let myself a deep sigh and then got off the sofa. I was back to return to me when I found her, so I said, Good morning. Early riser, I see. I almost succeeded at suppressing a grin when she dumped jump in surprise. Good morning. And then I looked down, and the sight completely succeeded, wiping the smirk off my face. It's a familiar looking kettle on the floor, and a spreading dark puddle that had to be the remnants of yesterday's stew. How'd it come to this? Um, uh, see, do for breakfast. Kettle boiled over. Went to take it off. Stuff burned, and, uh, uh. Okay, so to explain a couple of things. A curious smell, for one thing, and the end characteristic warmth of the house, for another. I looked over to the stove, and sure enough, it was lit and burning bright. Then had the following sequence of thoughts. One, man, this is weird. Two, hmm, I certainly didn't build that fire. Three, so she must have have. Four, man, this is weird. Hmm, not bad at all, actually. Ever since I became a monomicide, I've always lived alone. It's a stray kitten who invited herself into my life for a while, but obviously cats can't light stoves or build fires. Of course, she didn't stick around forever. One day I woke up, she was gone. You didn't get skated or anything, I see. That's a relief. I'm not mad at you or anything, so there's no need to apologize. I'm so sorry. Wait, did I just tell her not to apologize? After that, I started cleaning the mess up, but La wasn't having any of that. Okay, fine, whatever, so I figured we'd do it together, but she wouldn't have any of that, either. So in the end, she stubbornly insisted on cleaning the mess all by herself. And the kitchen was all spick and span, broke fast with some pastries. Set out once we finished eating. Any particular place you want to go? This was how the job worked, as our guide was sure around town. As she grew more and more comfortable with life here, the more opportunities I would have for a mon monomicide to erase the memories that have corro so corroded her psyche. The thing was, I really didn't like doing any of this. Not that it mattered. Hell, it was my job. I didn't have a choice in the matter. Oh, it wasn't as if I was bad at it. Quite the contrary, I was quite efficient both as a guide as, and as a monomicide. I had two years of rigorous training in both to thank for that. It was mandatory for life, sure, and I passed with flying colors. Really, the only reason I hated this part of my job was because I simply hated walking around outside. I mean, what was the point? Up 
to you. You are my guide, yes? Paul looked up from her glass of milk to briefly flutter her eyes at me. I thought she would say something like that, but still, that bothered the hell out of me. Now I really want to let out a sigh. Alright, let's go. Best to take your coat with you. It's cut out, you know? La nodded and then undraped her garment issued top coat from her chair. We walked out the door into her frozen town. She trailed me by a few paces. The streets were deserted. The defiance of the day stars of wane. Advanced as shadows beat long tattoos on her snow choked leaves. Eaves. There are a little under a thousand licensed monomicides here. Each of us each one of us had a guest. Then there were government governmental personnel. Oh yes, and a people who had special permission to set up businesses in town. Too few people, too many girls. That was the problem with this place. The Dolo was a pandemic. The witness for the monomicide protocol ran into the hundreds of pages. There just weren't enough of us to go around. While I was gazing about at the storefronts and houses, what was it that she saw? All I could see was an awkward clot of brick and ice and ruin congealing out of slushy asphalt. Now, as I continued to walk along, she stopped to look at something, then started, then stopped to stare at something else entirely, then started start again, and so on. Naturally, quite a gap arose between us. I thought for a second about waiting and matching pace with her. It was far more fun to just watch her antics. So let her be. Black Iris, where are we going? Ah, oh, shit. Hmm, let's see. How about some nice, delicious coffee? There's this place I know in 6th Street. So let's take the trolley from here. What? You heard me right. Don't tell me you've never ridden one before. I haven't. That uh, struck me as more than a little odd. Other than foot, there's no other real method of transportation around here. The trolley system was so good anyway that no one really minded. The other cities of our country had public transit systems that were at least as well developed as ours. It's how normal people got around. The law here have been chauffeured around here for all their life, apparently. The family must have been very rich, or very important, or both. As I stopped to think about this, La took the opportunity to sprint past me towards the station. So she could be this lively at times, eh? Fascinating. However, since a small figure is already receding into the horizon, I was going to have to cut my reverie short. A smile came to my lips, unbidden, and I began to walk again. We got off the trolley at the 6th Street station. Headed towards our destination. La, of course, continued to make her frequent investigatory stops. In this case, it's entirely understandable. Her house was on 8th Street. That end of town was mainly private residences. The 6th? Well, it was the closest thing we had to a shopping mall around these parts. Allah seemed intent on examining every single piece of merchandise in every single display window we encountered. Our destination. By the way, it was not on 6th proper, but on the back street of Lock or so away. The store is unadorned for, but for a nameplate that simply read, Aroma. As we opened the door and walked in, a chime rang out and, soon, thereafter, so did a casual voice. Duck. Welcome. Hey, wait a second. Why, if it isn't Black Iris, long time no see, man. I raised a hand in casual response. This proprietor here was one of the few acquaintances I had, you see. Been out of town or something? I haven't seen you around these parts in forever, you know. I've been here the whole time. What did you do, barricade yourself in your apartment? <laughs> That's not good, yo. Oh, I got it, I got it. Don't tell me. You... My acquaintance flood of sarcasm suddenly went dry when he spotted the girl who was standing behind me. Actually, it was more like La was hiding behind the folds of my great coat and scoping out the cafe's interior. 
Uh, got a girlfriend? He at least had a good grace to manage a strange smile. La, on the other hand, reacted with no grace at all. She startled, flushed red as a beat, began to shake her head violently. Fascinating. Let her go for a bit longer until I became distinctly afraid that she might very well shake her head clear off her shoulders. This is my guess. Uh, I see. Right. No way a cute little thing like this would shack up with an oddball like you, right? What was I thinking, man? This was insulting. But it also happened to be true, so I can really say anything. Had Law sat at the counter, then took a seat next to her. Welcome. The name's Rook, and the honor's all mine. Don't you be forgetting me now, okay, little lady? The man should wink, sly wink at Law with that last sentence. Smooth, man. Real smooth. Too smooth for me to want to intimidate, imitate. As a matter of fact, you know what I mean. Law must have been as dumbstruck as I was, and she took a very long time to answer. Left. Charmed, I think. She then bowed politely. Too politely, almost. Look of surprise flash across Rook's face. Then he burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, have we got a bona fide cutie here. Hey, little La. How old are you? Rook asked as he leaned over to the counter and grinned. I sighed inwardly. See, this was just like him. He was like a dog with a bone whenever something interested him. My polar opposite, in other words. Oh, uh... La, of course, was squirming uncomfortably in her seat by now. Obviously, this attention was unwanted. I sighed outwardly this time around and turned to face Rook. You know what's good for you? You stop harassing my guests, please. I'm not harassing her at all, man. I'm just really interested in her, that's all. What's wrong with getting to know her a bit? Nice and personal, huh? Fine, have it your way. Just stop glaring at me like that, man. Rook shrugged vaguely as if to say, You're damn scary when you glare. La, meanwhile, was sighing with relief that her interrogation was over. Did you come for lunch? It's a bit early for that, but hey, whatever. So, what'll it be? Up to you. Hey, La, anything in particular you want to eat? Um, no, no idea. That came as no surprise. There are no menus here at Cafe Aroma. Rogos just made whatever he felt like anyway, and there was what the customer had ordered or not. So I guess it was my mistake to even ask the question in the first place. Dude, just what kind of guide are you, anyhow? Looked ass in surprise. Well, yeah, someone like him who smothered his guests with all manner of unwanted attention would find me odd. Hey, Lil La, wanna be my guest from now on? I swear you'll have lots of fun. Sorry, no. Brooke smart Riley, I was to say, Oh, that's too bad. Got busy behind the counter. Much to my surprise, La smiled back. So obviously, she was starting to warm up to him. A female guest, though. Just what was Dexter thinking, anyway? Rook wondered aloud as he began washing some vegetables. This Dexter, by the way, was the supervisor to whom several monomicized, including Rook and me, reported. Every single one of my assignments came from Dexter himself. Law, for instance. But isn't it official policy not to allow male-female pairings? Man, if that's changed, where am I going to be up for one? When am I going to be up for one? 
most likely never. You, or the girl, who fear for her life. <laughs> You're probably right. After all, if I've got to live with a cutie like Lil La here, there's no telling what might happen. That reminds me. Hey, little lady, if Black Iris here does something he shouldn't, you come running to me, you hear? Not a frying pan, to the fire indeed. By this time, Rook was slicing up some fillets of fish without having to even look down at what he was doing. Now, I wasn't so bad at cooking myself, but this guy really was a pro. Like most other top flight chefs, he's a real eccentric. Case in point, he'd rather give us monomicized status than his cafe here. Although, he didn't have enough customers for this place to be viable. He'd probably be wildly successful if he ever opened a restaurant somewhere other than this godforsaken town. But he couldn't do that. He had no incl inclination to either. Here you go! He put gargantuan in fish and vegetable burgers, grilled to perfection before each of us. Laz looked almost as big as her head, but she bravely grabbed it with two hands and started digging in nonetheless. As she dug in with total gusto, the look of delight in her face was just fascinating. Well, she got mad if I stared at her for any longer, so I turned my attention to my own food. Rook watched us eating for a bit, and once he was satisfied that we were satisfied, began grinding some coffee beans. By hand, I never seen him do it any other way. Soon, the aroma of fresh ground coffee filled the air. So wonderful, in fact, that made La looked up from her burger. Coffee? Wait a second. The way she said that, it was as if this was the first time she ever even encountered stuff. Okay, the trolley thing I can, I could explain it away, but this? Curious sir, and curious sir. Nah, not coffee at all. This little lady, this little lady is what we call espresso. Although Black Iris, when he can't get through. When he can't get that through his skull, I, I tried, you know, I tell ya. Is that different from coffee? Totally. The way the beans are roasted, how they're pressed, how much caffeine there is, how it tastes, all different. But a barbarian like Black Iris here would never understand that. Rook pulled the lever on his espresso machine as he grumbled. Then, with a calculated pause, he pulled the lever again. No grumbles this time around. Two demitasses, each filled with this wonderful smelling dark liquid, materialized before us soon at thereafter. Here you go. Sweets for the sweet, la. The Cafe Mocha's got your name on it. The usual Cafe Coretto for you, Black Iris. Impeccable timing, as usual. As we both just finished our burgers, La picked up her demitasi gingerly, as it were the most delicate thing in the world, breathe in the rising vapors. Smells good. Of course. This is my specialty, you see? Now, Rook was always this way with the ladies, but today he seemed to be even more effervescent than usual. Then again, La wasn't brushing him off the way that most women did, so maybe that was it. Oh, right. Black Iris. Got an assignment, and not from Dexter. Consultation requisition for a high-level mnemonicide. Lucky you. You've been tapped. Tapped? Wait. I'm currently with Guess. Not safe or legal to double up like that. Come to think of it, yeah. I wonder, how come Dexter didn't tell me you were with Guest anyway? He's usually really good about that. Probably just a communications breakdown. Anyway, let my regrets for me, will you? Rick froze and shot me this half sheepish, half evil look. You and I had been colleagues for long enough that I knew what this meant. He would have screwed me over. 
<laughs> no choice, man. I uh, had to agree. Let's just say this new client is well connected. While Rook himself was competent enough, the nomicide, his true talent in that area was as a fence. He ran a black market brokerage that matched monomicides with prospective guests outside of official channels. It's all strictly hush hush. None of us had a, said a thing about it to Dexter. He hadn't asked. Our clients were diverse, but they all had one thing in common. They were rich and powerful. I had no idea where Rook found the time to own and operate his fine and uh, unprofitable restaurant given everything else he did. I suppose, I suppose that made him something of a workaholic. This case will be a cinch, I tell ya. You'll be done in 24 hours. I guarantee it. No idea why they insisted on a class alpha nemonicide, really. <laughs> it's a rare pleasure to see him groveling and begging like that. Except it wasn't that rare. It was no pleasure at all this time around. I didn't care about this being a technical violation of the law, so as long as my his pay was good. It was, but right now, law was my guess. She had priority. That was something I couldn't violate. So I was going to have to say no. But then, as if she could read my mind, Law casually said, Don't mind. Your call. But... No worries. As you were. Her speech was as curt and to the point as usual. There was something awfully ill at ease about the way she said it. What? Does she dislike being pampered the way the rules dictated guests must be? If that was so, she really was an odd one. Most guests who came here were so starved for attention at first that they grew addicted to her care. Wait, they love really did dislike being waited on hand and foot. Is that why she was assigned to him a nomicide who wasn't particularly good to her, his guests? That brought up all sorts of possibilities that I didn't want to think about. Alright, fine. But you owe me one. Oh, don't bother calling me at my apartment. I'm not there. Currently at the house on top of the hill at 8th Street, so send your client there. I'll make it up to you somehow. 8th, eh? Isn't that kind of out in the boonies? Nice and peaceful, actually. So much so that I had half a mind to move there permanently. Oh, get off it, man. You're not old enough to retire yet. Anyway, thanks a bunch for this. I'll have the client at your location by the day after tomorrow. Roger that. Three of us killed some time together after that. Lana would have stayed longer, but it became obvious that the clouds were preparing to burst with snow. So we left in a hurry. Luckily, we found our way back to her place on 8th Street before the first flakes began pouring from the sky. Another day passed. Another day passed. One thing became permanently apparent by now. Law was oblivious to the ways of the world. It was tempted to chalk it up to her being a stuck up spoiled little princess but uh she wasn't stuck up she wasn't spoiled and she didn't put up on airs like a princess generally the guy is supposed to take care of all the housework la however was actively helping in any way she could she couldn't keep her hands to herself if she tried and she wasn't even trying anyhow the weird thing was it wasn't because she felt sorry about making me do all the work the way her eyes glistened the way she skipped and hopped about, it was obvious that she was having the time of her life. There were some ways in which this came as a relief. I had not, for instance, been looking forward to the prospect of doing a girl's laundry. So, obviously, I was more than happy to let Law take care of it. Well, that is, other than the fact that she had no idea how to operate a washing machine. I can remember clearly how she stared at it for the first time around, tried to figure it out for herself. After a long time deep, she came running to me, defeated. When I told her which buttons to press, her eyes lit up, and off she went. Trial, error, trial again. Success. 
Let's try to pattern so that day. Now is another time for this other guest to arrive. I hadn't been able to make take La out anywhere yesterday just in case Rook might need to get a hold of me. I'd be stuck here today too. After all, I really only have one day with this guest. Finding obliterating this psychic corrosion was going to be my priority number one. Now, I expected that Law would be bored of her mind, but she never had a word of displeasure for me. In fact, she seemed to be enjoying herself, judging from the spring of her step and a twinkle in her eye. Very so often, though, she comes to me with loneliness and loss written all over her face. We stay by my side for silence for hours. But not for these times. It would have been almost impossible to believe that she was afflicted with the dolor at all. There's someone knocking on our door as I was cleaning up after breakfast. I immediately abandoned my dishwashing and rushed to answer. But by the time I rounded the corner to the foyer, I already started knocking again. When I opened the door, I was surprised to be greeted by a face that was much lower to the ground than I expected. James. Uh, um... I, uh, was referred. I, I have an appointment with Dr. Black Iris, the Monomicide. Is, uh, is he here? He happens to be me. What? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. It's just that you're a lot younger than I thought you'd be. Not younger, eh? That was my line. Rook, man, you're killing me here. You didn't tell me you were starting a babysitting service. I mean, I was younger than Law, even. A lot younger. When Rook has told me about that this client was well-connected, I assumed that he was talking about a government official or a captain of the industry, not this. Um, my name is Marcello. Nice to meet you, sir. Pleasure is mine. Please come in, in then, Marcelo. Um, you may call me Mar, if you please. Would you please? Huh? Well dressed, with a haughty manner of speech to boot. So I was definitely dealing with a rich kid then. Great. When Mar stepped into the living room, La almost dropped the plate she'd been washing and stared. Not surprising. She's probably been expecting someone a lot older. And taller. At the uncomfortable moment, she whipped back to her dishes, squeezing her sponge so hard, hard that suds curled out onto the sink. Her surprise, however, was dwarfed by that of her new arrival. S -s -s Sorry. He suddenly and inex inexplicably bowed his head in apology. Now I had no clue what was going on anymore. And seeing as he was flushed, bleat red. I didn't want to know what was going on inside his head right now either. So I sighed and hastened to explain the situation, but... Mar, this is La. Uh, oh, I, uh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea your, uh, lady friend was here. Uh, uh, give me a moment. I'll leave right away. Mar didn't even let me finish my sentence. The very moment that he finished his sentence, though, Law's finger chose to go completely nerveless. The unfortunate thing was that she kind of had a plate in them. At the time. There was a crash, a much tinkling. White porcelain sh shards spread all over the kitchen floor. Now he had not just one, but two young people, blushing so furiously that they might as well have been on the surface of the sun. I just wanted to bury my head in my hands and be done with the day. Law happens to be my guest. Just like you. Uh, huh? Uh, oh, uh, I see. Right. I had no idea. Well, hopefully you have one now. Moore sank down to her chair, as if his last words had drained all the strength out of him. Oh, La, be careful not to get cut there. Want some help? N no, thanks. I'll be fine. That didn't make me worry any less about her. 
Now that she said she would be fine, there was much I could do. So instead, I turned to Mar and began anew. As you already know, I am Black Iris. I met Monomicide. I'll be your guide for a short time. If you wish to call me by any other name, go ahead and do so. I won't mind. Thank you, sir. Glad to be in capable hands. We'll see about that. Now, would you tell me a little about your psych corrosion? How did it start? Do you remember? Up to this point in their treatment, my to La Mar had not differed substantially. But La was a severe case, necessitating a long internment here. In her case, my only course of action was to chip away her psych corrosion slowly over weeks and months. I had no choice. How could I, when my guest was so clearly numb to the depths of her own sorrow? In comparison, Mars Delore is only mild. Guests in this situation usually knew exactly where the psych corrosion was coming from, could point me towards the source with relative ease. Then it could move in with surgical precision, cut the memories out cleanly, quick, and simple. Mars shot me a confused look, then spoke hesitantly. Psyche corrosion? No, uh, um... Actually, uh... I just want you to erase every last memory I have. He was joking, right? If he was, that was pretty funny. But the way he was looking at me, it was quite obvious that this was no joke at all. But rather... Rather than saw La poking her head out of the kitchen, Obviously, she overheard everything. Obviously, she was quite intrigued by this turn of events. It was entirely obvious whether or not she finished cleaning up the broken porcelain. So, um, you want me to erase, what, 10 or 11 years of memory all at once? Is that it? 15, if you please. My apologies, then. I'm afraid that's... Impossible? Even for you, Dr. Black Iris, the Class Alpha Monomicide? I'd heard that Alphas were incredibly powerful. Are you trying to tell me that even you have your limits? Pardon my asking, but are you even an Alpha at all? He was really fixated on this Alpha thing, wasn't he? Or he was trying to provoke me, trying to provoke me into action by slandering my abilities as a Monomicide? If he was, he was making a big mistake. I know such pride in my profession. But then again... I didn't recall ever having used the word impossible. I answered honestly. But this did not seem to make Mar particularly happy. I could hear him muttering, So you can do it, in almost a dispirited air. I searched his face for a long time indeed before I said anything more. Yes, I can. But some preparations are necessary. I think I'll be ready by nightfall. Can you wait that long? Uh, oh, uh, of course. I will wait. All right. Then feel free to do whatever you like until then. If there's anything you need, just holler. I will be around. Yes, sir. I left Mar where he was and headed into the kitchen. I look a little concerned. A total erasure? Impossible, right? Who knows? I've never tried it before, but I think it can be done. Probably. Probably. Nice of you. We monomicize do have some. Interesting capabilities, you know? What? Are you afraid? I looked down the floor for a moment. When she snapped her head up again, there was something akin to anger in her eyes. No way! She turned heel and stormed out of the kitchen. My, my. So I made her mad, huh? For a long time after that, the three of us quietly waited for the passage of time. Sat on a stool in the kitchen and watched La Mar. La was re reading a book. Mar was sitting a little apart from La, patiently waiting for nightfall. 
but this odd arrangement didn't go on for long. Soon enough, Mar turned to La and hesitantly broke the silence. Uh, um, if I may inquire, uh, what book are you reading there? Psyche's Gatekeeper by Analog. Pardon me? It couldn't help but suppress a smile at this. With such a haughty individual, Mar certainly had no idea what he was, or wasn't, talking about. Then again, it was surprising that La wouldn't even know of, let alone read, this particular, this particular book. Psyche's Gatekeeper, a book, written by Anna. Oh, uh, right. Of course. Um, pray tell, what kind of book is... Oh, dear me. A thousand apologies. I had no intention of being a bother to you. I just smiled at this. No problem. Happy you asked. Shall I go on? And Mar blushed furiously in response. Not that I really could blame him. I was really cute when she smiled. Uh, of course. Please, by all means. <laughs> what an irony. I thought, a marked, a markedly blunted effect is reported in virtually every case of the doler, and my two guests here don't seem to have that problem at all. A treatise in Nimamicide, the protocol for the systematic erasure of memories. The writer is Nimamicide himself. This Anneli person? Really? Really. Dr. Anneli, class Omega Nomicide, or so it seems. C class Omega? Wait, uh, I thought they were an urban legend, a, a fairy tale, you know, uh. They are quite real. Real and incredibly rare. One in a thousand, or less. Actually, the proportion was even lower than that. There were perhaps ten known class Omegas in the entire world at present. From class Epsilon up to class Alpha, there was a smooth linear progression of ability. But class Omegas? They were a different kind of beasts altogether. To put it another way, without them a true cure for the Dolor would be impossible. Even an alpha like me kind of permanently erase the memories of my guests. I can only make them go away for a time. Sometimes that was a long time, but never forever. I just held these memories at gunpoint for as long as I was able. But a classic Omega could, and would, pull the trigger. All guests left this town with holes in their heads. Whether this was accomplished through the tender mercy of Slough's slaughter or the cruel anointing of a class Omega's touch. Was it all the same? Happy memories, sad memories, all guarded by Psyche's gatekeeper. A steadfast warden won't let you in, even if you want to forget, especially if you want to forget. Mimics are thieves, they trick Psyche's gatekeeper. Emulation, that's what they call it. Once the gate is open, Manamasai could walk right in and take whatever he wanted. Come to think of it, that did sound an awful lot like a thief, didn't, he, didn't it? Fortunately, I didn't have to think much about such philosophical implications. I was just here to do my job. Child and Manamasai's have no power. They grow stronger with age, more complex. Stronger gates demand greater power. Simple. Take the crazy son of a gun to emulate the complexities of a well-fortified gate. Um, 
And in English, uh, that means... The more powerful the monomicide, the more bizarre he tends to be. An alpha-like black iris here will almost always be a royal pain in the neck. So it is written. As annoying as it was, it was all true. Even I knew what a hopeless eccentric I was. Oh, I think I understand now. Thank you for enlightening me. I salute your intelligence, Miss Law. Flattering, but no. Had to reread it a lot. Still don't get most of it. Actually, her summary was more or less correct. In fact, she'd been able to explain it all in her own words. She knew what she was talking about, obviously. She read into it quite deeply. Or it's more correct than you knew. Law was damn intelligent, all right. Truly, Miss La, I am envious. You see, I... Just curious. You don't have to answer this. What do you plan on doing after your memories are erased? Well, I, uh... Want to wipe yourself away? Start clean, is that it? That may well be. Mar muttered as he nodded weakly. Instead of pressing him, La simply waited quietly for his next words. She didn't have to wait for long. I am not strong, nor am I intelligent. I cannot even converse smoothly with other people. I am a failure, without any recourse. Even were my mother and father to have any expectations of me, I would never in a million years be able to meet them. It would be better if I were dead. It would be better if I had never been born. Your parents say that? No, not at all. They would never say anything like that. They have always said that they love me, just the way I am. And that makes me very happy, but still, it, it pains me that they are forced to nurture me in that manner. I cannot forgive myself for my own lack of ability. Enviable. Huh? That you have such loving parents? They truly are. And I truly appreciate all they've done for me. You want to throw that away? Are you really so sure? Mm hmm? Um, uh... Lament Mars' bewilderment head on with a vague, clouded smile. Then she said no more. I got up my chair and walked into the living room. It's time, Mar. My preparations are complete. We can begin at your convenience. Huh? Oh, of course. Very well. Final confirmation. You want me to erase all 15 years of your past existence? Y yes sir. I would not, however, tamper with any memories that are necessary for your basic function. Like going to the bathroom, eating, things like that. Trust you understand why that is. But as for the rest, all your happiness, all your sorrow, all your love, all your hate, all your suffering, all your pain, all that's within you, will die. D die? Correct. He gulped loudly. His eyes were wide as saucers gaze back at him coldly. The loving kindness of your parents, too, will die, along with you. And Mark grew very pale, started shivering. He struggled to gain control of himself for a while, eventually managed to issue some noises that sounded vaguely like words from his quivering lips. Uh, um, 
Uh, I, uh, think, um... Changed your mind, have you? Y yes sir. He nodded slightly. Obviously, he was close to tears. Without a sigh. I'm afraid it's a bit too late for that now. W what? Mar, to be honest, I initiated a treatment phase of the monomicide protocol a long time ago when we first met. What? But, uh, how in the world? Did I tell you from the very beginning? My name is Black Iris. I'm called that for a reason. All I had to do was look you straight in the eye to begin the, the process. No way. That means... Yes. You're slowly losing yourself as we speak. Impossible to say exactly how long it would take, but rest assured that your memories are withering away and dying. One by one. So gently, in fact, that you yourself will never notice. Can't be. Tears began to flow from his eyes as if some dam inside of him had burst at last. He stood there silently, waiting for his next move. No. No, 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 no. I beg of you, give me my memories back. Please, I'll do anything. Just give them back. Give myself back. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I, I don't care anymore about the stuff I said before. I have to be myself. Or, or else I wouldn't be better off dead. Words fail him after that. Just wept and wept and wept. Lana had nothing to say either. He just stood there, waiting for the flood of tears to end. We waited forever. Tony stripped the room like virgin snow. Mar looked exhausted. He stared up at me with eyes nearly as empty as my own. Dr. Black Iris, thank you for everything. Now that I have had a chance to reflect upon it, I think I could have grown to like myself. But I was too stupid to see what was right before my eyes, and now it's all gone. I hate having to say this to you. It's too much like a sermon to me. It occurs to me that it's a miracle in of itself to be loved the way you were. Mar nodded smoothly. Absolutely. Therefore, until all my memories are gone, I shall strive to get to know myself as well as I can. It's the most fitting kind of funeral I can think of. Certainly. You know, though, your new self would probably be much the same. You'd probably worry about the same things. You'd probably be loved the same way by your parents as you were. At least... So I hope. That's so very kind of you, Doctor. Not at all. Just doing my job. Besides, you're about to become very mad for me. I assure you that I'm not angry with you at all, sir. No, but you will be. It's only it was I who could not bear to look more in the eye, not the other way around. Great, now what? Why the hell did I do that? Um, Mar? Y yes, sir? Um, well, you see, uh... Sir? Sorry. I lied. Pardon me? The truth is, I haven't done a thing to you all day. What did you say? I've not initiated treatment at all. Your memories have nothing to fear. They won't disappear from you. What the? Oh my god! 
Y you tricked me! That's right. Sorry. Sorry? Sorry? Wait! That means... Mari yelped in utter con consternation. Looks so wretched now that I quite regretted what I had done. I was too late for apologies. Or so I thought. The reflective mood left as quickly as it come, but Mar burst to peals of unstoppable laughter. <laughs> he was laughing so hard at first, I thought he's gone off the deep end for good. There was something about this. His smile, the first real smile I've ever seen from him, told me otherwise. Behind me, I heard a high, warm voice raised in merriment. That was La, and she was giggling. Oh well, whatever. Could live with this once every once in a while. As long as it was a long while. <laughs>